Hello, everyone. My name is Ian Rowe. And I'm Nike Fajors. And welcome to The Invisible Men, where we make the achievements of incredible men invisible no more. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of The Invisible Men. My name is Ian Rowe, Senior Fellow at American Enterprise Institute. And today I'm coming from a special location in uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And Nike, good to see you. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, I'm Nike Fajors, a member of the Leadership Network at AEI, and I wish I was in Jackson Hole. <laughs> well, yeah, we, we need to do some special episode locations. Well, let, let's talk about that, um, especially when we have great guests like uh, James Hill, who's, who's uh, rocking the tech world. Uh, James, good Thank to you. see you. Thank you. Good to see you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yes, yes. So, James, you are a software development architect, entrepreneur. You are an inventor. I don't even know what this means, but of the new crypto property technology that's called a bracket chain. And so we want to hear that's all right. about that. And, and I, awesome. love that little, I love the drawing that you have behind you. Cause that, yeah, you, thank you. Yeah, yeah that's, that's my daughter's. daughter. Yeah. Just to, just to continue to show how how uh, how accomplished you are, you've been training your 10 year old daughter from an early age on coding. That's right. She has her own website. She does. Yeah. It's called girlcodeclothing.com. She's been working on it for okay. a couple months. So be on the lookout. You're 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 already in the overachiever category. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really good to see you, man. So before you tell us about the bracket chain, tell us a little bit about James. Uh, you know, before you even knew knew about what a crypto property meant and any experience that you had early in life that helped shape your kind of worldview? Yeah, well, I don't want to go too far back, but I'll say one of my earliest memories that really shaped my understanding and eagerness to get involved in property was here in St. Louis on the south side of uh, St. Louis, right on California and Utah. There was a small... Um, business owned by the Nation of Islam, a gentleman by the name of Robert Earl uh, Muhammad. He took me in as a kind of a high school slash summer worker, and he kind of gave me the opportunity to run his entire business. And, I, you know, as a kid, I really didn't understand that opportunity. But now looking back, it was such a it was such a, a position to have to be able to you know, call anywhere in the world on behalf of this company, even though it was a small company, um, we tre- we treated it like a corporation. And, you know, I was able to bring that company from its small beginnings, even at an early age to start generating, you know, thousands of dollars a day. And, you know, it was a really great experience for him and his family. I got to really learn a lot about his culture and about the nation of Islam and his kids. And it helped kind of mold me into the person that I am. So I really like to re- outreach and, you know, just kind of reach back a little bit. And that's how I got into just valuing neighborhoods and property and, and then also valuing the, the information you get from kind of taking responsibility for a small business. So that's definitely where I kind of got my, my start. Got it. And it sounds like you, you like business uh, runs in the family. Maybe. Yeah, you could say that. Uh, at least it's starting to. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're because you own a company with your wife. I do. Right. My wife and I uh, founded a Lambda Systems um, in 2014. Uh, I software developer. She uh, has a double master's from SLU. I went to Webster. Um, my background is in technology. Hers is in business. She's been r- running corporate boardrooms at local uh, SLU, as well as SSM for the past 10 years. So she helped me build my business and build my 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 uh, connections with the government. And so now, you know, we, we have our top secret clearance with the government and we have our facility clearances. We've got contracts with companies like Northrop Grumman, uh, Periton, uh, Ligos, Boeing, um, just to kind of name some of the few uh, companies we've worked with, uh, Microsoft as well. Uh, so she's she's really helped build that business. Her business acumen is just amazing. So I just really kind of sit back and let her do her thing. And um, I focus on uh, the software development and the technology. 
And it's kind of a really good pair, definitely. James, what, what do you think it was that that gentleman saw in you that he gave you the keys to his business at such a young age? I think for me, it's, I don't covet other people. At least I try not to. So he was able to trust me, you know, with everything because I wasn't really after the money per se. I, I do like money. Don't don't get me wrong. But I, I don't want his money. You know, I want my money. So I think he kind of got that sense from me. So he was able to trust me uh, to be able to kind of handle that responsibility. Um, not to say that I never made mistakes or anything like that, but I definitely own up to whatever I, mistakes I ever make and try to increase my my value and how I'm able to bring more to a situation. So over time, you know, he realized that. So he was able to, you know, offer me, you know, a higher and higher position, more money. You know, we opened up a couple more locations. He has three locations still now. He's in St. Louis. He, he has his own brand uh, of laundry detergent called Lyft. He just recently got that uh, trademarked. Um, so be on the lookout for that. He has a, a really great um, business group called uh, Backing Black, B-I-B. It's, uh, it's a group on Facebook, and it's, it's really a nice organization. It's more of a certification that your, your business can get. So he saw that, you know, I was able to kind of latch on to some of his concepts and help him grow those concepts. Um, I was really eager to make an impression because, you know, school – where I came from, I came from more of a white neighborhood and white environments where the, the narrative was that, you know, blacks can't do anything right. Um, and I just always thought that was wrong and it didn't make any sense to me. So the first opportunity that I got to get into a position of, of any kind of power, I just wanted to just bulldoze through any kind of like preconceived notions about what I was capable of doing, you know, to really put a lot of those misconceptions to rest. So that was kind of what I think he really saw there. And he gave me, you know, the ability to kind of prove myself again, not to say I never made mistakes, but um, every time I made a mistake, I was able to come and say, you know, I see what you know problem was and uh, really address it and be able to resolve it and move forward. So it was a it was a great opportunity. You know, I still have a really good connection with Brother Robert. We talk all the time. His son actually um, is mentoring through me now. He's uh, his son's going to go to my academy and we're doing the software development training with him. So it's been a great kind of like full circle, definitely. Got it. And before you describe what crypto property bracket chain, how did you make the transition into coding and programming? Where did that fascination come from? Yeah, that's interesting. So my background, my mom um, and my dad split up early. I went to live with my grandmother and I decided to go to the army early. So I uh, got emancipated, got into the army, graduated high school at 16. I had, you know, straight A's in school. So I was able to get into a program where if I graduated at 16, I could join the army. So I decided to do that because I didn't have much other opportunity. Um, the opportunity with Brother Robert was really good. It was just I needed to go to school. I needed some other, uh, you know, influences. So I kind of took what I learned from him, you know, and it, and it was just a summer job most of the time. So. You know, when I was in school, I had to focus on like college and other things. So the army was something that was kind of knocking at my door. I scored really high on their their ASVAB and they put me into software development. So I started writing software for the army uh, at like 17. Um, I did two years active, two years inactive. Um, right when September 11th hit, I was uh, in Fort Hood. And, you know, I, I remember going home after that and basically getting into college. I, I got into Forest Park Community College. I started there doing my undergraduates, uh, my first two years. Um, and I just took the experience I had from the Army and, you know, my undergraduates. I got a role at Savis Communications right after the uh, September 11th. I got blessed to be able to build the American Stock Exchange, the new American Stock Exchange. So I was able to be at the ground floor building the uh, – basically the full digital system from New York all the way to LA. So I worked with Thomson Reuters and uh, CenturyLink, which used to be uh, Savvis, um, to help build out all the configurations and design this new system. So that kind of helped me 
start getting into software development and I realized that it was a great role for me. So I just kept at it and I've been at it for almost 20 years now. Wow. Okay. And now here's a $64 billion question. What is crypto property technology? So crypto property technology is a technology that is designed to capture value and title of any type of object that's known to man and put it onto a new type of ledger system that's network-based versus a digital ledger that is just software-based. So the bracket chain is more of a physical system than it is a digital system. It's a hybrid of what we had before with credit card systems and what we have now with, with, uh, with Bitcoin and Ethereum. It's more of a hybrid in that it has a network architecture that is closer to a DAG system, which is a one directional graph system, which basically uses network topology algorithms to decide based on neighbor tables, if these transactions are valid or not. It basically uses the underlying internet as a transaction system instead of sending everything to one central credit card system or breaking it out into a software um, blockchain, it uses a one directional algorithm to decide if this transaction is valid or not. So it's, it's a different approach. And the concept is not 100% novel, um, but our application of the DAG is novel in that we're using a holographic approach. And our application of the DAG and how we authenticate our NFTs and how we authenticate our wallets is totally novel. Um, and also how we distribute our ledger and, and uh, consolidate our ledger data is, is also novel. So we've taken the novel aspects and then we've also taken the hybrid approach between a traditional one dimensional blockchain, which a, a blockchain is a DAG, um, believe it or not, but it's only a one dimensional DAG. So our systems that we have in the credit card world um, they work based on gateways and, and basic database systems, but all the information in there is not logged the same way that a, a traditional blockchain would be logged. So what we're doing is we're taking those two technologies and merging them into a hybrid technology. So, and then on top of that, we're adding a novel uh, way to authenticate our NFTs and our blocks, I'm sorry, and our uh, uh, wallets. So there's, there's a, a lot of detail in the white paper. We're coming out with more documentation every day and our team is growing as well. James, I just, you know, that was wonderful. And it's, a, it's just a, a joy for I'm sure Ian and I to just hear you articulate and get excited and passionate about something that's transforming the world. Probably three episodes ago, I referenced a story that I think I read in Detroit about a 50 something year old brother that had hit the lottery and won $30,000. And what he ended up doing with the $30,000 is buying a $25,000 gold chain, which he was wearing at a gas station. He got jumped and these kids took his chain. But what I said on the episode is, God, if he could have invested that money into some area of crypto or into your business and think about the transformation and the generational impact that kind of investment could have had. And so do you have a message for the brothers out there that are working hard, saving money, or hit the lottery for 30000 How should they think about this crypto stuff and investing in Coinbase and these things? You know, I think they should think about it the same way they think about maybe the average hustle. You know, try to equate it to, like, basic math. You know, if I add one plus one, I get two, right? So... If you look at crypto and you look at just about any kind of property system, they threw, you know, first of all, let me just clarify, cryptocurrency should be really called crypto property, you know, and that's where the Federal Reserve came out and, and declared that it is not a currency. You know, none of this is currency. It's all property. They're all assets. So that's why I'm able to do what I'm doing and not actually be locked up for creating a new type of currency because technically it's not a currency. That's just a buzzword, you know, just kind of media spin what's going on. Um, but I digress. What the average guy um, 
can do with this currency or this property is treat it like a property. You know, and if they understand it for what it is, um, then, you know, they'll probably have a better instinct on what to do with it because the guy that went to buy the gold chain, his instincts are good. You know, let's go buy gold. That's a good idea. But it's an old fashioned way of doing what he's trying to do. So just re-educating them and basically explaining to these guys, um, you know, that they have the right idea, you know, and they can do this. I'm working with a guy right now. Uh, I won't say his name. He's a he's a guy from St. Louis. He came to our office and wanted cons- consultation on crypto investing. You know, we give him all disclaimers. We're not giving you any financial advice. But what I will tell you how to do and I will educate you on how to do traditional use traditional instruments and how to apply traditional approaches like scalping and short selling and uh, arbitrage. Right. So I sat down with this guy and he's got a really interesting background. He's got on child support and all of this stuff, but he has, he has a a decent income, but he doesn't want to put it into the traditional banks because they're going to take his money. So, you know, I tell the, I tell a lot of these guys, you know, there's, a lot of opportunity for you to control your money a lot better in the crypto market than you can in the traditional banks. So I just appeal to them as, as many ways as I can. Right. So that's a lot of what I do. You know, that's what I would tell these guys. It's just, you know, I, my advice to anybody trying to reach out to Daryl or anybody like that is try to appeal to something that they would understand and try to break it down into a digestible nugget, you know, and, the, you know, the guy, he asked me flat out, you know, how am I, am I going to make money? You know, where's my money? You know, so that's what we just basically said. Okay, here's your Ethereum. You see this amount? Okay, wait five minutes. Okay, now it's up. You made money. Okay, write down how much you made. Now do that 60 times a day on $10,000. That's $6,000 a day on 30. That's only a $30 transaction fees. You make $30 on each transaction times 100 transactions a day, that's if you're doing 24 hours a day. If you're doing 60 a day, you're getting closer to $3,000 a day in profit just on $10,000. That's just making quarter jumps. So if you're essentially just watching the market, buying Ethereum, waiting for it to go up you know, a quarter percent, then they're generating income. So I just appeal to their instincts and what they want and what they need. I break it down into a digestible format. Right. I was actually just asking what's happening in the interim during those transactions, just for people who really want to just get a deeper understanding of how, how is it that money is being generated? So it's just like what, it's just like with any property, right? The higher there, the higher demand there is, if there's people out there ready to buy it, right. They're ready to buy it at the next price. If you're in line outside at Foot Locker, right. And there's only a hundred pairs of shoes for sale right now, if, you tell the manager, I'll pay $10 more. He might let you in before the next guy, right? So that's how the price ends up going up because there's a limited volume and there's a limited uh, demand. So if the demand can somehow manipulate their position, the only way to do that is by offering more money, right? If you offer more than the standard price, then your sale goes through before the other guy. So that's what causes the price to go up that demand and that competitive bidding that happens. So that competitive bidding happens as the demand increases. As the demand reduces, the reverse happens. And that's what causes the price to go down, that reverse inflation on the demand. So those two dichotomies kind of work hand in hand. So what you want to do is you want to watch the market And you want to watch for calendar events. You want to watch for standard events like morning time, nighttime, right? You want to watch for global events like market openings. When do people wake up? That matters. When do people wake up? That matters. As soon as people wake up, they're going to start doing what? Spending money. When they're asleep, they're not spending money. So the market is going to obviously go down in certain places. So you have to understand like how you're investing. It's similar to how you would invest in regular currency because regular currency does follow the sun. You know, when people are awake, they're spending money. So the demand on a currency will change and the swap rates will change depending on their relative uh, demands. So it's similar. It's very similar to regular currency in that nature. And it's also similar to regular property 
in that the higher the demand is, the more you can ask for it, right? Like your home. Thank you, James. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a topic I could listen to you lecture on for, for several hours. We're going to transition now into the podcast to, to something we call the speed round, uh, where, where we offer you uh, a, a couple of choices, either individuals, philosophies, ideas, ask you to pick one and tell our viewers why you chose uh, one or the other. Given the conversation we're having, I'm going to start with the first one, which is crypto or reparations? I think reparations. I would go with reparations. Why? Well, because reparations can also include crypto, right? So that's a false choice. Tell me more, though. What do you mean it can include? Because reparations can include money, crypto, or whatever kind of property equals the value of the reparation. So it doesn't need to be denominated into one or two type of currencies. Because if you want to be technical, tons of countries benefited from slavery. And if we're going to start getting reparations from crypto, no, no, com- no country even owns crypto. So that's actually not even logical to use crypto because no country has dominion over it. So I, I don't normally put editorial into some of these, but the way I position those to you is, you know, there's a lot of folks that spend a lot of time on reparations. No, I, I, I definitely get it. Yeah. That spend a lot of time on crypto. Right. So, I think you've indicated through the education you provided us and where you're investing your time and your wife and so forth, that you're putting more time into building something right? versus looking to, you know, capture some value from some past injustice. Well, I believe rep- getting reparations is, you know, going to capture that value from the past injustices, right? And if any of those f- members that are in fault, you know, happen to have crypto, if they want to use that to pay their bill, they can, but it needs to first be converted into dollars and then given to us as dollars because that's where it's owed in dollars. Very fair. Uh, Next question, civil rights or economic development? I would say civil rights for the same, almost the same reason as the other question, because one would actually give you both. You know, if you check, if you take civil rights, you would get economic development as well. So I like to pick choices where I end up getting both at the end. Okay. Malcolm or Martin? Malcolm. Give me the why, brother. Well, because, you know, for one, he had a lot of self-control even to his de- detriment, you know, he stood on his principles no matter what, even at his risk of his life. And that's admirable. And the, the last one, uh, Jay-Z or Kanye? I would say, oh man, that's a hard one. <laughs> man, that's hard to pick there, man. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to. You got to do it. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> I hope they don't see this. Uh, <laughs> I hope they do. <laughs> I don't want any beef, man. <laughs> so I'll, I'll say Kanye just because he's um, no, let me go with Jay-Z. I'm going to go with Jay-Z because he created Kanye. Again, you get, you'll get Kanye if you get Jay-Z. So I'll go with Jay-Z. Fair enough. Appreciate that. Thanks James. No problem. All right. Well, James, as, as we come to the end, I, I really have uh, two questions. Well, one question before we get to talk about Daryl. You know, you're in the software arena and you're a rarity in terms of a black entrepreneur who's making inroads in that sector. If you talk to a lot of Silicon Valley entrepreneur CEOs, they're looking to cultivate more, particularly uh, uh, young minority talent to come into the sector. What do you think has to be done to mobilize more young people to be able to see the possibilities that you saw? I mean, your daughter, who's 10, is already coding HTML. She has a website. And so she's already like, that's not outside of the realm of possibility for her. But that's not the reality for a lot of kids. How do you what what do you think? What do you think the industry has to do to increase the talent pool coming in? 
I think it has a lot to do with the media. You know, all we can do is influence through programming. Um, that's the only tool we really have uh, at the end of the day. You know, when you talk about a broadcast kind of uh, thing, because onesie twosies is not going to do it, you know. So if you want to make real hardcore long term impact where you're talking about thousands of new developers a day, um, you're going to need a savvy marketing campaign with an individual character that's basically appealing to the youth in a way like I, I just bought a brand new Corvette, you know, Z6 like that. I got more students signed up just driving my car than even talking about the class. And I've been talking about this class for, you know, four years now, you know, five years now, you know, and I do pretty decent. I got a grant from the government to pay for this course. The students, you know, they're coming but when I talk to the Department of Education and I ask, OK, how many how many people actually sign up for just classes like this in general? They tell me a number and I'm like, wow, that's a lot. That's way more than the students that I'm getting. Like, so I'm like, well, where, what are they signing up for? They're signing up for CDL license and they're signing up for construction jobs. Now, these are all great jobs, but they're not high paying and they're, you know, they're high risk, you know, so. What I, what I would say is a media campaign that's basically exposing all of those things and showing the obvious truths. Like, when I, like, man, like coming out of high school, making almost 100 grand a year. That's where I was at. My buddies in the hood trying to sell drugs, I'm still making more money than that, then and now. So, you know, a lot of my friends will tell you they wish they would have got into software. I try to tell them and teach them, you know, but they get stuck in their ways. They got their own paths that they want to do. But to answer your question, I would, you know, I would basically create a media campaign that's glorifying getting rich off software development. James, that sounds amazing. I'm actually starting a high school network in the Bronx next year that will have a pathway for if someone wants to be on a college pathway or a careers pathway they, where they can do apprenticeships in 11th and 12th grade in computer science. Um, we're looking at a partnership with Cisco. So yeah, there, there are definitely more and more ways that kids can come out of high school and it's not disparaging college, but you can be yeah, generating definitely revenue. Not. Right, you know, definitely not. No, I would love to be involved. We're working with Ligos right now with high schools here in St. Louis. We're doing a interesting pair where we're taking an inner city high school, six of their students, and a county school and bringing them together. And, you know, I'll have them from September until December. And, uh, and, and that's gonna be pretty that's much, um, you know, gonna, it's gonna pretty much be uh, a life-changing event for these guys. And, and what grade are they in? They are all seniors. They all graduated this year. So th they're all basically returning. Instead of going to college, they're taking this this class, this basically, it's, it's kind of a class, but it's an internship, apprenticeship kind of thing, where I've got a couple projects lined up for them. Um, they get laptops from Ligos, and it's a partnership. You know, it's similar to what you guys you're talking about with Cisco. So I would love to get involved with more opportunities like that because that's going to help spread the brand, and that's going to also help spread the awareness. And that's the mission, you know, bridging the gap between people and so technology. So this is a nice, this is a nice segue into our young man, Daryl, who's 16 yes. years old. And Daryl, you know, lives in forgotten USA. He may not go to a high school like the one we just described, right? But he's got dreams and aspirations, but he doesn't know who James Hill is. He doesn't know what a bracket chain is. And yet you have a way we want, we want so Jay-Z may not see this show, but <laughs> Daryl might watch it, right? Right. <laughs> So the question, James, is if you could reach Daryl, who's 16, black kid, he's hearing a lot in media about what his possibilities are. What would you tell him about his future? If I can meet him face to face, I'll tell him what I tell all the guys that I, young guys that I meet face to face. I'll say, hey, you got a job. You want to get into software? You jump in. I'll take it down to my office. I do it all the time. You know, I'll take a guy, just met him. It's dangerous, probably. Uh, but 
I think it's worth the risk. It's not dangerous. It's not it dangerous. Can, it can be, but it, it's usually not. And you're right. And um, there's tons of more. You're right. It's not dangerous. And I take them down to the office, you know, and I sign them up for the class. You know, and if they can't pay for it, I got a scholarship. I've got the grant. I've got other partners that help me fund the, you know, their tuition. So it's not about, you know, trying to find another barrier to send them away. You say, oh, you don't, you can't do it because of X, Y, Z. And you'd be surprised. You've got guys like Daryl, but you also have guys like I would say Adrian, like one of my students uh, who's 40 and he's an HVAC guy and it just didn't make enough money and he's got kids and he's got medical stuff and he's about to be 45, you know, and that's, that's like a whole nother guy, right? And Adrian is smart, but he doesn't have time to go back to school because he has to work and all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, I've got, I've got, you know, the same love for that guy too. So I'm going to pick him and work with him after school and in the evenings or whenever, you know, on my off days and all of that to try to make an impact. So I've got Carlos who was working at a gas station, you know, he's had felonies. He got into a car accident, you know, running drugs, wanted to change his life. Um, he went through the career builder system at the unemployment office and uh, he found out about my class and 12 months later, now he's working at Amazon making six figures, you know, so even. All right. That's who we need record, on the next you know? guest on the invisible men like you. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. That's, he would love to be on the show. Like Carlos is, he's a hard worker. Like he didn't, you know, he didn't really get the material at first. Like for sure. He was like, he took the class twice. You know, and I have a policy, like, if you finish the class, I won't charge you again if you want to take the class again, especially if I see that you're really trying and it's just not sinking in because I know people, it takes a long time uh, for is, this is stuff to class, really. Is the class taken in person or virtually? It used to be only in person because the grant, but somehow, you know, one of these un weird blessings from COVID is the government changed the law where now I can do all my classes virtually. So it's really been a blessing in disguise. All right. When, when we post this episode of The Invisible Man, I want to post uh, the opportunity for anyone who's interested in potentially doing it virtually okay. so they can find out how to get it. Thank you. All right. Wow. Well, James Hill, thank you, man. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate being on the show. You know, when I first heard about the show, I was like ecstatic. I didn't even know you guys would ask me about it. And then all of a sudden I got the invite. So I was just like, oh, okay, this well, is you're happening. The, you're, you're exactly the kind of person we want to make sure many more people know about what you were doing with your family, with your business, with helping other young entrepreneurs. You're part of the reason we've created this whole show in the first place. So thank awesome. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you guys so much. And so for all of you. Yes. And so for all of our listeners, if you want to see any other episodes, of the invisible men please go to www.invisible.man and with that my name is ian Rowe. james tremendous uh, couldn't be more proud of you uh, ian you. said it as a father as a mentor as an entrepreneur as a risk taker uh i'm just so excited to watch your journey you're doing exceptional work well thank you and i i i extend the same compliments to you I went through your background and the work you've done all over the world. It's just been amazing. It's such an honor to meet with you and talk with you guys. Um, I'm following, you know, in some big footsteps, but at least there's some footsteps. Brilliant. All right. Thank Thanks, James. Thank you, guys. My honor. Bye. Thank you for watching another episode of The Invisible Man. You can find other episodes at the AEI podcast channel on YouTube or the website invisible.men or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.